This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the glory, from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with your joy in your presence. Father, we thank you. We give you honor, give you glory, give you praise. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would touch hearts and change them, that you would move, reveal yourself to people as they've never seen you, personal and in power. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. When you think about Easter and you think about communion, because it's a, it, it's a, they kind of go to hand in glove. But communion defined is the sharing or exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental and or spiritual level. You're communing. You're getting deep. We can say it like, like that, right? In John chapter 14, uh, Jesus replied and said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him. And he will come to him and make our home with him. And, and that describes communion, love, true love. Often equated to a love between a husband and a wife. As bodies of, a body of Christians, communion means uh, having a common faith or a common discipline. You come together, you have different communions, if you will. You have the Anglican communion. Uh, the Catholic have their sense of communion. But in Victory Arts, we have ours sense of communion. We're a, we're a body. We have a vision. We come together and we agree. And, and Paul, writing to the Philippian church, was talking about, okay, that's fine and dandy. There's all the communions, but really there's one body of Christ that we come together. And he tells the church, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So when we walk like that, we are actually walking in communion. Although we celebrate our communion by taking the bread, and it's not a bread, it's a wafer, not very good bread, it tastes like plastic, but would you take it anyway? Amen? We celebrate by taking communion uh, and drinking the cup. What I'm, 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 I'm worried about, I don't want us to become idolatrous about this activity. And that's what was happening when Paul addressed the first, first Corinthian church. At this communion service, Paul said, you know what? You're having, you're breaking bread and you're coming together for Christ's sake, but you've messed it all up. You're not doing it with the right heart. Remember, if you have any communion, any sense, you're not doing it with love. You're, what have you turned it to? And he would begin to question him actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 all the way through 11 when you come into the communion uh, uh, description. People turn the Lord's Supper into an idolatrous event. And in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he says this. And he's talking to them because he's getting ready to do communion in chapter 11. And he tells the church, I don't want you to be ignorant. In fact, brothers, I want to tell you something. He says, our forefathers were under a cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized to Moses in the cloud and the sea. They ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, say nevertheless, Check this out. It said, God was displeased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered over the desert. So they had a communion. They started out well, but because they didn't do things according to what God wanted, basically he said that God allowed them to die in the desert. 
Paul rebuked the church for lacking really consideration and for their disrespect for each other. And he was dealing with the, the, the Corinthian church. See, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, you need to do it to the glory of God. We don't do this because we're trying to impress and look holy. We can fake that anywhere. No, we're, we're, not, we're not doing this because people are looking at us. We're doing it because we want to have a communion with God. So if we do that, he, he's telling the people, so if you're going to do it, don't cause people to stumble. Because some people say, oh, you're not doing the communion right. Why? Because you're supposed to do it like this, like this, like this. Uh, and if you do, don't do it like that, then you're not really right. If you don't go through these certain classes, you can't even take the bread. Or you can't drink the wine because you're not worthy. Only the worthy ones can drink the wine. And that was not God's intent. It was an expression to show us what he did for us. So in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians, again, we'll come to the communion service here. It says, therefore, my dear friends, flee from all idolatry. He's telling them, get away from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge yourselves for what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? It is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. See, today we celebrate the resurrection. Right? Death couldn't keep a good man down. So, but what good is a celebration, be it any celebration, if Victory Arch Colorado Springs fails to have true fellowship? What good is it to come out here and look good if we're really not doing good? Well, hmm? So what good is a celebration if we disrespect each other? What good is a celebration if we argue, wrestle, and fight? So then he deals with the church, and he comes to chapter 11 and verse 23. If you want to read more about the rebuke, you can read it later. But he does all this, and he comes to 23, and he says this. For I have received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the reason we do celebrate uh, this communion is not for no other reason, not to separate a class of people because they're more worthy to take the cup. Because in fact, none of us are worthy to take the cup. That's right. That's right. And really the good thing is that, the good thing is this isn't really that holy. Because if it were, then we should just look at it and never touch it. Because we are unholy. No, we're not doing it for that reason. We are doing it for one reason only. To remember. To remember that Jesus died. To remember huh, that he was on the cross, that he shed his blood. And to remember that he's coming back again. Amen. To remember that he rose from the dead. See, so that's why we do, we're doing this. This is a memory pill. It beats Alzheimer's. It's better than ginkgo balboa or biloba, whatever you call that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? This helps us remember. So as we remember, I want you to take the bread. And we remember that he was on that cross. And, but before he got to that cross, they beat him to a pulp. Not just beat him. They beat him to a pulp where his face was unrecognizable. Blood was coming out of every pore in his body. They beat Jesus to a pulp. That's why we take this bread. Let's take the bread. And we take the cup. Why? Because it was the blood of the Lamb. Great song. Worship the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. Worthy is the Lamb with nail scars in his hands. The final sacrifice for all. That's why we take this club. It's the blood. Let's remember his blood. So our communion is represented by what we've done. 
But our communion is proven by who we are. Our communion is proven by the vision and the cause we have. It's not simply a, a, a ritual. See, because we are looking for people that are hard to keep down. See, it's hard to keep a good man or a good woman down. We, and we want those type of people. Because every now and then we're going to get knocked down. Anybody ever been knocked down? We're going to get knocked down. We're going to get hurt. We're going to stumble. We may even fall. But a good man, a good woman will get back up. They're not going to stay on the ground. And we have so many examples of good men and women in our country, in our history. You know, I'm a history buff. I love history. At age 22, this guy, he failed in business. Young man, had a big vision. At age 23, he ran for legislature and, was, and he lost. Wanted to be a, a, a congressman, couldn't make it. At age 24, he failed again at business for a second time. At 25, he was elected to legislator. He finally got elected. At 26, his sweetheart, the one he was engaged to be married to, died unexpectedly. At age 27, this same man, under the stress of all what was going on in his life, had a nervous breakdown. At age 28, he was defeated for Speaker of the House. At 31, he was defeated for Elector. At 34, he was defeated for Congress. Again, this guy just kept losing. At 37, he was elected to Congress. At 39, he was defeated again for Congress. At 46, he was defeated for Senate. At age 47, he was defeated for Vice President. At age 49, he was defeated again for the Senate. At age 51, he was elected President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Oh, he fell. He may have failed, but he didn't stay down. Hmm? So you can't keep a good person down. And in this opening verse, Peter makes three uh, statements that blow my mind. Because people always try to keep Jesus down. Oh, you can be saved, but shh, don't talk too loud. Don't act too holy. I mean, you're getting too holy now. You know, if you get too holy, you can't go out and get high and people will talk about you. See, Jesus, rather Peter was speaking how Jesus, the doubters, couldn't keep Jesus down. You notice in verse 23, he said, You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men who put him to death. See, the doubters couldn't keep him down. He comes to his own, yet his own didn't even receive him. They doubted who he was. Who was this guy? He was doubted by his brothers until after the death and resurrection of Christ. They doubted he was God. Jesus suffered at the hands of his family because they could, surely Jesus couldn't be the son of God. That's just my brother. That's my son. No way. His own disciples at times questioned him. One betrayed him. Another denied him. His hometown, they didn't want nothing to do with him. They said, oh, isn't that the son of Joseph? So the day you first received Jesus, and now you probably can relate to this, you go home, I know the first day I received Jesus, I went home, I'll talk about me, I don't want to talk about you, and I see my family, and the, the day before, I was no good. Even, well, the day after I was no good, but somehow Jesus came in there anyway. And I go to my brothers, I'm still looking at them, and I go, what do I tell them? And then they light up a joint, this is what happened. I go, oh man, now they're getting loaded, I got to tell them now. Because they're going to want, they're, they're gonna want me to get high with them. I, I said, what do I say? So you go home and you try to figure out what you're going to say. Finally, it comes out. No, I can't have that. Why? I'm saved. See, my family was a godless family, and they didn't know what saved was. They go, what are you saving? I go, no, no, I'm saved. He goes, oh, well, how do you get saved? Well, what, is, what is saved? And then I really didn't know what saved was. They told me I was saved when I went to church the day before. And I came home and I just told him I was saved. But I knew something was different. And I, I began to say, so I don't know what that means really, but something happened to me. Huh? It finally came out. I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart. And then the doubt came from my family. Because they knew who I, I was. The first thing he said was, shut up. And here, have a drink. No, 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 I'm saved. I accept Christ. Be quiet. Want a shot? They just wore the tequila. No, no, I, I accepted Jesus Christ. I'll oh, be quiet. See, unbelief began to come into me. And actually, the unbelief, will, if you're not careful, will stifle the anointing. That unbelief that wants to attack the very experience that you have. 
At the crucifixion of our Lord, Jesus had died and, and now was buried in a borrowed tomb. His disciples left him. They hid themselves. So in their minds, they're questioning the last three years of their life. Can you imagine? What the heck did we do? We gave up everything and followed this guy. He said he's going to you know, have a new kingdom, and there is no new kingdom. The brother's dead. What do we do? Why do we follow him? So here you have the disciples, fearful, frustrated, questioning their next move. See, the world is always full of skeptics. People doubt, right? You can sit in your seat this morning, even now. Some of you might be questioning the resurrection. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Are you sure? Maybe you're just believing a folk story. Or maybe we are. But I tell you one thing. A dead God couldn't change me. No psychiatrist could change me. Uh, no, no man, no woman, nothing can change me. I know one thing. When I came in encounter with the Holy Ghost, when I came in encounter with the Most High, something changed me. Uh, so you can question if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but whether you question it or not, whether you die or not, or not let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It, it, it's really not contingent on what you think. To all the daughters, I say, you can't keep a good man down. Uh, see, death couldn't keep Jesus down. And death tried to take him out. The daughters or, or, or death could not keep him down. Verse 24, it says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible. I like that. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I like that. Jesus put an end to the agony of death. The agony. Now listen, I'm going to let you know something. We're all going to die. Hello, someone. You're going to die. I'm going to die. As I get older and older, I think about it more often. And you know, I, I, I get, get weird. I go, man, that's going to be, that's going to be kind of weird. I'm going to die. I wish I could open my eyes in the casket and just scare everybody. <laughs> But I'm, we're going to die, right? James 4.14 says this. Why do you, do, you do not even know what will tomorrow, what happened? What will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You're, you're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, unless Jesus comes back during our time on this earth, we're all going to die physically. Jesus just took the agony. Jesus, the Bible says, took the death. Oh, the sting, rather, of death. The sting. I was trying to think of an example, and I remember one I used years ago. How many of you are afraid of bees? Or, what? you know, bees? Anybody? Now, there's a story of a lady, you know, and a guy, old guy, rather, driving his truck. Had his wife and a little girl, a little small truck cab. And there was a, a bee got in the cab, and they're driving now, lady, if you're afraid of bees, what would you be doing? Uh, <laughs> screaming and yelling. Well, exactly. That's what I, they're driving on their own, and this guy's driving his driver's truck, and they're screaming and yelling. He looked at them like, what's wrong with them two crazy ladies? And he's just driving along, and they're screaming and yelling, and they're all, bee, a bee, a bee. And the old guy sees the bee, and he sees the bee flying, and he grabs the bee, and he holds it in his hand, and the bee stung him. And they go, no, stop crying. Stop yelling. Stop making noise. Because the bee can't hurt you no more. Why? He goes, he opens his hand, and he pulls the, the, the bee stinger off of his hand. He goes, because I took the stinger. See, that's what Jesus did. He took the sting from death. Amen. It doesn't hurt anymore. He grabbed it. He snatched it. Oh, we may die, but it doesn't hurt. Jesus put an end to the agony of death. See, when we die, it's just a transition from the temporal world to one that is permanent, to this world is fading away. We live in a world where, where rust, rust and moth will eat at whatever you have. I don't care what you, how much you gain, how much you have, or how much you own. Guess what? When you die, it's gone. Jesus put an end to our death, the agony. And in verse Matthew, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62, it reads like this. On the next day, which is one after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, 
This is right after the, resurre- uh, the, the crucifixion. And these Pharisees were worried, and they're wondering what's going to go down. And they said, they said to Pilate, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, the deceiver said, After three days, I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people he is risen from the dead. And the last deception would be even worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure. So they go to the tomb where Jesus had, and they roll a big stone. You know the story. You've seen the movie. And they plastered it shut. The stone rolled in place that the tomb was secure uh, by the guards. And then Mary comes with the story, and the, the greatest problem that Mary had, because she wanted to prepare Jesus' body for, for death and the burial, the greatest problem she had was how was she going to get close enough to Jesus? How was she going to get close enough to his body to anoint him? She had a great problem. But I'm here to tell you something. The biggest problem was that stone, and it blocked the way in and out, Right? So God takes the biggest problems of our life, and like that stone, he rolls them away. I don't care what kind of problem you have. I don't care what kind of situation. Listen, listen, listen. If he conquered death, hello, somebody. Don't you think he can conquer a bill? If he conquered death, don't you think he can take care of your relationship? Sometimes we look at this big old trouble. It'll never happen. Look at that big stone, and you're looking at the husband's head. That's not the problem. Hmm. He'll just roll it away. God rolls a problem away. Huh, your problem may be immovable. Your problem is surrounded by the guards of doubt. No matter how hard you try to keep your problem, you can't contain Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's the beauty. You can't contain God. Your problem can't contain him. In fact, if you're a child of God, God has to bust out. He has to roll the stone away, the stone away. See, when Jesus is Lord of your life, it's impossible to contain him. I don't care what happens. Because he, remember, the enemy wants to quench you. The enemy wants to short-circuit you. So he'll throw things at life, hoping that he'll just stop your purpose. God has a purpose for you. And he wants to stop it. It may be anything. And you got to understand, if Christ is in you, no stone, no situation, nothing can contain it. No matter how hard you try to keep your problem, you can't contain Jesus. See, so when Jesus is Lord of your life, let me say that again, when Jesus is Lord of your life, Jesus lives in you. See, so if you have, and if Jesus lives in you, that's why I'm amazed at some people, if Jesus is in, in you, right, then how can a problem bother you? So you have the ability to remove the stone. You have the ability. You have the issue. You have the mind of Christ, right? I, I, I say like this. Now, I'm from California, and you don't have them here. But in California, you have one thing that are really, really scary. And I'm not talking, no, I won't say that word. I'm not talking that. You have Earthquakes. Anybody ever been in an earthquake? That's a trip. Earthquakes are a trip, right? Because the earth quakes. It, it actually rolls. I, I, you look at the, like a highway and you see an earthquake, you can see the asshole go like this. Like, whoa, that is really, really weird, right? And the whole earth is shaking. See, controlling, uh, containing Jesus would be like an earthquake happening and you jumping on the ground to stop it. I don't care how much you jump on the ground, you can't stop it. It just keeps shaking. It keeps rolling. Huh? And that's what it is when Christ is in you. You can't contain it. You can't stop an earthquake. Right? So we celebrate the resurrection. There ought to be happiness and a song in your heart. In spite or despite your issue. And I know, hey, we all have problems. Anybody have problems? Don't look to your neighbor. Look to me. We all have problems. But despite that, we should have joy. We should have a song in our heart. Because if you have a problem, that's just like something to give God glory. You got a problem, God will solve it. And he, may, he, may, he will not solve it your way. He will solve it the way he thinks best, but he will solve it. Hmm? Huh? 
See, death nor the tomb could not hold our Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian mother once said to her son, her son's name was Dan, and he was leaving her to go back to the East Coast. He didn't want to go because she was very near death, but he had to go back. And he, he said, I'll be back, but I got to go back for some time for business, and, and I'll be back. Well, she's an old Christian woman. She said, well, son, when you come back, if I'm not here, you will know where to find me. Huh? Because death had no sting. See, death couldn't keep him down. The disciples couldn't keep him down. The devil couldn't keep Jesus down. The devil couldn't keep a good man down. In verse 25, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Peter was telling these people, I want you to know, devil, you can't keep Jesus down. From the very beginning, when Satan fell from heaven, the Bible says he wanted Jesus' power, supremacy. He wanted to be Lord of all. So God cast him out of heaven, a third of the angels with him, and the devil had a plan. He was telling the devil it didn't work. Devil, your plan failed. You can't keep the Lord down. When Jesus was born, he tried to kill him. This was part of his plan. Try to snuff out Jesus. Herod made an edict, and he killed all the kids two years and younger. Why? Hoping to get Jesus in the crowd. Didn't get him. The devil tried to get Jesus and take, him to, take a shortcut. He wanted Jesus to take the ease away. Let me tell you something. Walking with Jesus, the Calvary road is not the easy road. It's the easy road? Go smoke a joint, go have, an, go have a martini and get drunk. That's the easy road. Go ahead with your bad self. The Calvary Road is a tough road, huh? But it's the best road. It is a rocky road. And let me let you in on something else. It's uphill all the way. Hmm? And the devil tried to convince him, you know, devil, the devil goes to Jesus. You don't have to take that road. You don't have to go to Calvary Road. You don't have to go uphill. Let me, let me take you to the mountain. Let me show you. He wanted to give him a shortcut to avoid the cross. But again, Jesus looked to the pain. And so, no, I have to do this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in his humanity, when he's sweating blood and talking to God, he cries out, if it is possible, let this cup pass. The Calvary Road is a hard road. But his commitment to us, his fellowship, ah, his communion, reminded him, I need to die for the sins of the world. Jesus is on the cross, and he finally says, it is finished. Now, when Jesus died, Satan thought he had the victory. He, in fact, he thought he won. The devils and all the legions of demons, perhaps in, the, in my mind, I said, they, they might have been jumping around with glee. They finally said, he said, it's finished, it's done. We killed him. We can take control of the world. While they were preoccupied with their party, you know, they probably were doing something. Jesus went on an evangelistic mission. Did you know that? So that's why it took him three days. He could have rose immediately. But for three days, he had to have a three-day revival. Yeah, somebody. Jesus had a three-day revival. In 1 Peter 3.18, it says he suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. I trip out on that. I mean, when he was dead, his body was there, but his spirit was already up. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he could have went to heaven, but he goes, no, I, I, I've been to heaven before. been there, done that. i got to go somewhere else. Can you imagine Jesus? He goes, I've never been to hell. I'm going to go, go check hell out. So he goes down to where spirits were in prison, and in the Bible says Jesus began to speak to those spirits in, in prison, and he says he let captivity captive. He brought them out. You can go ahead and give the Lord a hand of praise. That, my friend, is the only sermon ever preached in hell. And he brings them out. Then after the three-day revival was over, he rose on the third day. Satan was beat for the last time. Because we're no longer in a battle. Jesus won. 
So you're not in a battle. It's like, you know, the war's over. We're the victories. Victory outreach. That's what we call it. Victory outreach. We're not called bum kick outreach. We're victory outreach. Amen? And our main task, we're just like sweeping up after the battle. We're mopping up. That's how we're doing. We're just mopping up the mess because the battle's been won. We just got to clean up the mess. Because the devil created a big mess here on earth. Huh? See, we are just here for the cleanup. Jesus is king. He's king now. He's king forever. The Lord of lords. And soon will come a day when he's going to take the church back. Ah, who is a church? He didn't say he's going to take a certain denomination. You know, some denominations think they'll be the only one in, in heaven. And let, let's let them think that. And we'll just put them in the corner and put a wall around and they can think they're alone. The rest of us will be part of the lamb, the supper's lamb. But the body transcends denomination, transcends ritual. Because rituals can very easily become ritualistic, idolatrous. Like I was talking about earlier, he transcends all that. He's coming for the body. Those who really have a relationship with him. Whether you have a, a title on your, on, your, on your door frame or you have a special Bible signed by the pastor, that's no guarantee. Huh? No, no. He's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle. A holy church. But until then, we have to never forget that Satan is defeated. He's a defeated foe. A toothless lion with no bite. He's only suitable for one thing, for the bottom of my shoes, because he's under my feet. Huh? So we have nothing to fear. There's not, nothing. Well, what, what, what can happen? You know, people tell me, aren't you afraid when we, we, we go to several places that are pretty violent and, and, and pretty, you know, to the common eye, normal eye, kind of scary. You know, you go in there where they have guns and, and murder and mayhem, and you walk in there, you go, aren't you afraid? I go, listen, dude, listen, young lady, you listen, old lady. Uh, I, I could have died many times back in the day, but the day I didn't die, the devil had his chance to kill me. You think if I go in there, you can threaten me with heaven? That's how they do. You can't threaten me with heaven. Are you kidding me? Hmm? The devil should have killed me a long time ago. No. See, the devil's a toothless lion. Got no, got no bite. As I close. See, when Peter preached, now I'll invite my piano player up. When pre Peter preached this message, courage began to sprout out of the disciples. Understand this. They had just took off running. Remember, Jesus was dead. And they were like still panicking. The authorities were after them. Get those guys, the people of the way, get them. And so they weren't too courageous. They're like, whoa, wait a minute. So when Jesus began to preach his courage began to rise up in them. The disciples began to re receive strength. So in the book of Acts, we find that church began to grow. And it began to grow for a couple of reasons. The first, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. See, when I talk about the resurrection... Oh, to me, the only, thing, the only thing resurrection to me means is power. Oh, let me say that again. The only thing the resurrection means to, to, me, to me is power. Now, you know, some people like the pageantry. Okay, how nice. And they like all this uh, nice fluffy stuff, and that's cool too. But what I like is power. Something about the ability for God to rise a human from the dead. Ooh. Think about that. You know, I would have loved to be there when Jesus said, Lazarus! Lazarus is dead. Three days, been rotten, more than three days, rotten in the grave. The worms were having lunch, and Jesus interrupted their brunch. Come on. Well, come on. Lazarus! And then he begins to cry. He begins to weep. And people say, oh, he's weeping because he, he cared for Lazarus so much. I don't buy that. I think he was weeping because he knew Lazarus was in glory. Lazarus was in heaven. He was out there. He was right there at the Holy of Holies. And he had to call Lazarus back to this wretched world. And he begins to weep. I can imagine. I'm sorry, Lazarus. I got to bring you back. 
I know you're having a good time, but I'm going to bring you back. Lazarus, come forth. The power of the resurrection. That's what I'm talking about. That I am convinced without a shadow of a doubt that it was the power of the resurrection that changed my miserable life. It was the power of the resurrection that gave me the courage, me and my wife, the courage to leave everything. We left everything, sold everything, left it, and came to this city. It was the power. I couldn't resist it. I try to think my way out of it, and as I'm thinking my way out of it, I'm packing my bags. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't go. I'm selling everything. I got no car. I got no money. I got nothing. Oh, what am I doing? But it was the power that pulled me and pulled me like a mop drawn to light. just kept pulling me. I couldn't shake it. So the resurrection is the power, the power of God unto salvation, the power of God unto a restored life, the power of God unto a marriage made whole, the power of God. That's the resurrection, the power. Huh? They had an attitude. Not only did they have the power, they, they recognized, look what we got. But they had an attitude, a mindset that nothing was impossible. Remember, Jesus said, you 12... You highly uneducated people, fishermen, you're going to take the world for Jesus. Could you imagine them thinking that? Like, Whoa, this guy's really tripping. Wow. What are you doing? He has Nazarene red, red, red bud or something, something, something making him trip. No. Huh? They had the mindset that nothing was impossible. They had just come from the crucifixion. He was dead. They, 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 they had just seen the rocks move, the earthquake shake. They saw the temple split from the top to the bottom, ripped in half. They saw the shake, the earth shake, and the tombs of 500 saints of old come out of the grave. All of a sudden, they go, wait a minute, dude. Wait a minute. If God can do this, taking the world is easy. If God, with one swoop of his glory, could raise 500 men and women out of the grave, boom, when Jesus rose, taking the world is simple. The battle is won. The plan is set. But what happens is the enemy keeps coming after his people to steal the anointing, to plant doubt. In essence, to kill you all over again. So you can't let that happen. Let me say it again. You can't let that happen. See, it's the spirit, that spirit of faith that propelled those 12 simple men to greatness. And I pray when you leave here today that you have that spirit of faith because you were called to greatness. You weren't just called to live and simply die. That's kind of boring. Just to go to work and make a good living. Well, that's cool, but that's kind of boring. Really, after a while, it's like, what else? What else? That's it? That's it? That's why we were, we were birthed, just to live, buy a thing, get a car, get a house, get a good TV, go watch a football game and die? That's life? No. We're called to rule. So the belief compelled them out into the community. That anointing, that anointing changed lives and gave God all the glory. So that's why we're here on Resurrection Sunday. Not just to recognize that Jesus resurrected, that we might be resurrected. Yeah. I want every about and every eye closed. As every head is bowed, every eye closed. The Holy Spirit moving and ministering in your hearts. On this Resurrection Sunday, I'm going to ask, as every head is bowed, every eye closed, 
Perhaps there's someone here today who said, I need prayer. Maybe you need forgiveness of sin. Or perhaps you, ne you never really accepted Christ into your heart wholeheartedly as Lord and Savior. But today, wherever you're at, you know inside that you want prayer. I'm not going to ask you to repeat a prayer. I'm going to say a prayer for you. And in fact, I'm not even going to ask you to come out of your chair right where you're at. If that's you, you fit that description. Or maybe God has got a call in your life and you're sensing it even more and more that God has something special. You're not even sure what it is, but you know it's something special. If that's you, if I described you in any form, any fashion, if that's you, Real quick, quickly, I want you to raise your hand and put it down. God bless you. Many hands all over this place, all over this room. God moving and ministering. You can put your hand down. What we're going to do is we all stand. Everybody's standing. We're going to sing a song. We're going to sing a song of worship. And I'm going to be praying that God would touch you right where you're at. If somebody needs a healing in body, God wants to heal you today. So let's, just, let's lift our hands to heaven. Worship the Lord.